Okay, so today we're going to be talking a bit about fast on-demand scams. And so as per the agenda, I think I'll just give you a bit of an overview of the, the issue, the interface, and then walk through the code a little bit. So let me share my screen with you. And Philip, your, your microphone's a little on the quiet side. I don't know if anyone else is having that problem. Let me see if I can tweak the settings a little bit. Yeah, it's a bit quiet. Is it any better now? That, that um, seemed a little bit better. Yeah, it is for me. Okay, cheers. Um, can you see the screen okay? Okay, so basically we've, uh, we're have we working on this new feature that allows customers to run task scans on demand. So in practice, it's probably best if I show you the interface. Um, what that looks like for now is that customer can run a passive DAS scan against the default branch, which is mostly going to be master, and they can run it against a target URL. So over the last couple of weeks, I've been working on the, the back end for this. So in practice, what that means is I've added a new GraphQL endpoint, which largely corresponds to the interface you've seen there. So you can see it takes a project path, target URL, a branch, and a scan type. Right now, scan type is limited to passive scan, but something obviously we can look at extending later. Um, in terms of what that actually does, is it essentially puts together all of the requisite resources required to run a DAS scan. So it creates a pipeline, a stage, a build, and then it enqueues that build. Um, and at, at the moment, what it does is it, it replicates what we've got in the YAML template. So you can see probably some information here that looks familiar if you're familiar with the, um, the CI templates. You've got the image name, the, the report, JSON, and all that sort of stuff. So I think probably what I should do is just show you what happens when you actually run one of these DAS scans. So we've got, this is the GraphQL Explorer and the Rails application. So you can see here, we've got this mutation called run DAS scan. I'm passing in um, project path that I've got running on my local machine, branch, going to run it against Yahoo, um, and it's a passive scan. So if I run that, you see it gives me back this pipeline URL. And if I go here, hopefully my runner should have picked it up. Okay, so there you can see what's happened is the pipeline's been triggered. We're actually running the DAS scan against that target URL. Um, it should probably just go ahead and uh, uh, run that. So um, that's, that's basically the, the, the long and short of it. Um, I know we've got some questions in the Google Docs, but does anyone have anything they want to ask just now? Uh, so I just wanted to dig into that JSON that you're creating, which is the YAML file sure. uh, that I saw in the code. So this is, it's literally the same text that would be in the YAML file. Is that accurate? Um, it's kind of, so it's, it's like, um, it, in the CI template that a customer would use, it would reference the DAS template, but this is like the expanded version of that. Yeah. So I guess one of the things I'm, I'm trying to understand is if we change the template itself. So traditionally we have just changed the, the YAML file. Uh, this is going to be another spot that we're going to need to uh, change it as well. That's right. Okay. Okay. And in that case, if no one has any other questions, I'll, I'll hop over to the Google Doc. I know Cam had a few things. Um, and, and to ask, I don't know if you want to take those, Cam. I mean, I tried not to write too many down. 
yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, I have questions about who has permission to run this. Do we have any, I don't know who has permission to run a scan normally, I should say, but I'm curious to know whether we've thought about it or not. Sure, so um, at, at the moment, basically it's anyone who can create a pipeline, but what we'd sort of discussed was that it should probably be limited to an owner, maintainer, or a developer for a project, which I, I think is right, but I'm sort of open to be proven wrong. Yeah, those are the three roles that, uh, that I think make the most sense. Uh, we might need to, might need to rethink that. And if uh, any of you have any ideas when uh, we get to the active scans, if that should be locked down anymore, then we can discuss it. Um, but right now, to me, it makes sense uh, for the developer, maintainer, owner to be able to run scans and then the other types. Uh, it doesn't really make much sense for me uh, for them to run scans. Nice. So is that permission currently, is that locked down without us doing anything just by virtue of it being a pipeline? Or is that something that um, we're gonna need to add some permission check in there? So we'll, we'll need to add a permission check. At, at the moment, basically it's scoped in the GraphQL endpoint. Um, yeah, so here you can see it essentially means uh, it uses this create pipeline policy. So we'll need to add our own policy, you know, for either running on demand scans in general or maybe running task scans. I'm not sure yet. And then uh, Derek, I don't know if we have an experience uh, design for how that's going to show up in the navigation. Um, and I don't know what our design rules are for that, whether that is hidden if you don't have permission or whether it's hidden and then the content changes if you don't have permission. Uh, I would imagine that we have some kind of design pattern established for that, but we, we should make sure that that design pattern uh, gets communicated to our front end engineers. Yeah, you're right. Um, I've never dealt with permissions so far at GitLab, so I don't actually know what the, the design pattern is. So I'll, I'll follow up with Camelia and, uh, and see if, if we've got one. Perfect. I, I think in this case, it might make sense to prevent them from reaching the page at all, so 404, and don't have it in the nav if they don't have permission. That would be my first thought. Uh, I agree with you, Aviel. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, it's, it's very possible that no one in secure has really thought through this because so far it's been sort of a, you have an ultimate license. Um, if you, I think if you're a developer above, you have permission to do most secure things. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll double check and see, but I, I agree with you, Aviel. So in terms of GraphQL, how do we, like what, what authentication mechanism is used? Is it just your session token? I believe so. Okay. But Under the hood, GraphQL uses the same policy system that the rest of the monolith uses. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay, so the, the next question here was, is this under feature flag? So yes, it is. Um, so this has been merged into master now, so you should be able to, to give it a go. I know Paul has also been working on the front end stuff, which I don't know if it's been merged in yet, but um, that may also be worth a look. Can, can you just walk us through how we would uh, try this on, on gitlab.com? Sure. Um, on gitlab.com, I'm, I'm not sure. I, would, I only really know how to do it locally. So okay. um, uh, let me see. Does the GraphQL Explorer work on um, GitLab.com? GitLab yeah, it does. Okay. Okay, so go to the GraphQL Explorer. Let me just see if I can run this. Um. 
Okay, so I think what you need to do is you need to enable the feature flag for your user, and then you'd have to run the mutation that's in uh, the merge request. But I haven't actually tried that yet. Do we have any idea of when the feature flag is going to be turned on? Like, is it next week? Is it a month away? Do we have no idea? I think there's still quite a lot of work to be done on this. I don't know if, I don't know, maybe Seth can speak to when we actually want to do this. Yeah, so uh, my thinking was that uh, when the front end's ready to go, we'll turn the feature flag on for a couple of select projects and test it out that way. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think we should just defer to once the front end is, is ready to go and then just decide which projects we want to turn it on for. Awesome. Thank you. I'm only asking because I want to know how much time I have if I decide to play locally or whatever. Yeah, so I think uh, probably for 13.1, we'll leave it under feature flag and that'll give us an iteration to play around with it. Uh, see how those results flow into the dashboard. Because um, I think there's some questions, for example, uh, like the demo we just saw, if you go in there and you plug in Yahoo and Google and all these other different random websites, what's going to happen on your dashboard? Uh, that may just start showing lots of different results from different sites and it might become a real mess. Um, and so we should play around with that to see if it creates uh, problems in the dashboard that need to get fixed before, before this gets released without a feature flag. Right. And to a certain extent, some of those things it's more of a need to know, like we need, we just need to know what happens. Um, because if a user wants to go in there and start uh, scanning just every random website that's out there, we can't really stop them from doing that, but we really need to know what it does to the dashboard and whether things uh, really work or not. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to wait uh, the milestone and, and hopefully release this, turn everything, on for all the users by 13.2, um, but it really does depend on what we find and if there's any issues. Okay, so the next question, Karen, you had was, um, can APIs be scanned? So at the moment, it's just totally limited to running um, the, uh, the, the DAS to analyze command, as you saw there. So um, I think the short answer is no at the moment. I suspect that means yes, though. So if okay. you plugged in a, a URL to a API specification, I think Zap would parse the API specification and run a passive scan on. Okay. So the, I don't know that for sure. We'd have to test it, but that will affect things like front end validation if we do something funny with our validation or it might affect some of our messaging on the front end, which is why I think it's worth testing. Cool. And, and just to be uh, kind of explicit, I, you probably all can kind of get, get the idea of where this is going, but naturally the next couple of iterations is to start introducing a lot of these environment variables that people have traditionally done through the YAML file to start introducing those in the web interface. Um, so whether this scans APIs right now kind of as a side effect or not, uh, I think the goal would be eventually to have those environment variables of the API URL, uh, the override URL, things of that sort in the web interface. Cool, the next question is really the big question for me is what happens to the security dashboard? And in particular at the moment, a merge request is like that point in time where you can work out what you've introduced and what you've fixed. Um, and I'm interested if introducing this feature and running an on-demand scan will change that. Uh, but I mean, I feel like this is one of the things we need to test unless anyone actually knows what the answer might be. I think it's a good thing to test. Uh, my hunch is what will happen is these will just show up as, as vulnerabilities on master. Um, because these are all attached to the master branch. So this would, it should act no different than a scan that's running on master. Uh, so you don't necessarily see what you introduced uh, with, this, with this scan. It just shows everything is, is currently present. Cool. We can test it anyway. 
Yeah, one of the ways we could test this too is to open up a couple different projects. And so you might test one project against what website one, open up another one, do website two, and then open up a third, do website one and two, and see if it's the aggregation, if they're deduplicated, see, see what happens uh, that way. Yeah, I, I'm kind of interested to know, like the scenario I'm thinking of is when like, you run DAS normally on your master with configuration A, and then you run it on demand scan with configuration B. You know, configuration B creates all these new vulnerabilities, and then you create a new merge request, and it says you fixed 30 vulnerabilities, but the only thing that changed is your configuration. But, I mean, maybe that's okay too. Yeah, I mean, you could have another problem where you have, let's say, 20 vulnerabilities, and then you go and run a scan against Google and let's say Google comes up with one and then your security dashboard says, Hey, you only have one vulnerability because it may see all of those as resolved, even though you're scanning a different URL. Although I think so, we have to manually resolve vulnerabilities now, don't we? I need to test the security dashboard based on what we have right now more, but. Yes. Yes. We do need to manually resolve them. So a new, a new scan with fewer vulnerabilities won't wipe out vulnerabilities that are there? They'll, they'll still show up in some state. I'm not sure if it automatically resolves them. It didn't used to, but it might now. Moving on. Yeah, so the next one you've got the account is reusing the the DAS template instead of duplicating it. So as you kind of rightly point out, basically what it's doing is it's it's replicating um, a bunch of the stuff that's in that YAML template. The, the answer to this is, is that I think is, is maybe, I'm, I'm not sure, um, because obviously that would mean needing to, to potentially go to the, to the Git repo and actually do a read or something like that. And when you do do that, um, I think we would need to take some extra care about what we allow the user to do because if you could essentially read the template from the Git repo, you could essentially do some other type of scan, potentially. You know, you could end up doing an active scan and we've sort of lost that control over constraining this to a passive scan. Philip, are you saying you'd have to go to a Git repo as opposed to um... I think you might be able to read it directly from the file system of where this is running. Okay. Uh, the one that's already packaged up with, with GitLab. Oh yeah, that's a good point. You could actually do it in, in the runner. Is that your, what you're saying? Uh, well, this code is running on your GitLab instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that GitLab instance should have access to that YAML file that's buried wherever the DAST uh, template is. Okay. I see. You. So you, you sh I would think you, you should be able to read it directly from the file system. So you shouldn't have to go out to some, some repository to get it. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, failing that, maybe we just add a comment to both that says, by the way, you should probably check out this if, you, if you're changing this. It's other place, you know. I know comments are not great, but just a thought. Um, it's one from James which says can DAS scan settings be saved if yes we could add a button to run specific saved configuration yep uh, that's me the let's see so the UI that you showed uh, it made me think of this um, I use inactive scheduled pipelines to capture variables um, that I frequently run pipelines with and then I go to the scheduled pipelines page and hit the play button to rerun that specific set or configuration. Um, yeah, I can see us doing something similar. If there's multiple multiple ways people frequently run DAS scans with you know with different settings or variables. Um, yeah. Anyways, just a thought. So yeah, that's actually exactly where we're going in the future. Um, oh. The uh, <laughs> the complete maturity. Uh, you'll have profiles basically for the scan settings and the site settings. So you can easily switch out if you're doing an API scan versus a, a single page architecture type scan versus a static uh, website scan. 
uh, all within the same project, as well as the different scan configuration options about you know uh, technologies and active versus passive or whatever. Uh, so that's that's actually exactly where we're going with the uh, the next level of maturity in test. Oh, awesome! Well, cool. <laughs> glad you guys already are steps ahead of me. I'm glad you're asking because it validates uh, where we're going. Uh, I think we missed point number five, which is just a note to say that passive scans are, are destructive, um, potentially. So, can you, sorry, can you explain that? <laughs> so, uh, typically, well, it basically means that when you run a passive scan, it does spidering. Spidering submits forms. Forms change state on a server, which means a passive scan can do, th do things that users may not expect on their website. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's really unlikely that anything would change that users care about, but it may just be worth putting in, like, you know, there's, I notice this little information icon that maybe people ho hover over or something on that screen. It might just be worth mentioning something like that on there. So the same um, advice would apply here of like excluding logout uh, URLs and and maybe delete users, and, you know, anything that, that could possibly change the state of the database in a way that they don't want. Yeah, although, so an example might be, you might, you might have Zap signing up new users in your registration form. Right. Yeah, so I mean, it's not, it's not gonna harm anyone, but at the same time, or alternatively, you might have new users signing up to your mailing list. Yeah, like either way, don't run it on production. Right. Yeah. But I can't remember who it was a while back, um, was running it on a local GitLab instance and ended up uh, deleting their entire uh, instance, basically all of their projects. Uh, so I don't know. I assume that the passive scan could do that just as well as the active scan. Cause it's probably just hitting an endpoint and uh, it might be actually, yeah, it might be able to do that. Yeah. So yeah, it's a lot of to be aware of. Yeah, and a lot of the danger comes in for the active scan, but it's also uh, the authenticated user, right? So as soon as we give that scan credentials, then theoretically that scanner could do whatever that person has with those credentials. Right, that's true actually. So it is much more dangerous than registration. And yeah, if you, if you spy to someone's site as a logged in user, then yeah. Yeah, and, and that's tip, and, that's also dangerous because you never design your website worried about that. You're never expecting Google to follow a delete link when you're logged in. Uh, so when you're logged in, Google can't do that. So you're not ever worried about that. But if you give our engine those credentials, we have more insight into your website than just a spider like Google would do. Yeah. That's um, a good point. On to point number nine. I'm just curious to know if our GraphQL mutations are rate limited. So if you go to that GraphQL page, can you just spam the play button and create like a whole ton of pipelines? Happy to test this myself. If uh, and there, there's an issue opened uh, regarding this that I was asking Dennis about this. There are some built-in rate limitations into our API, uh, which we need to just confirm to see how those are implemented here. But without us doing anything, there are some, um, some rate limitations. We may want to uh, decrease the rate for, for this. Cool. I'll test it anyway. Let's see. So if we're on number 10, uh, that's me. Um, <clears throat> oops. So if we are concerned about users pointing our DAS tools, uh, whatever they are, at random URLs and causing problems. Uh, we do have domain validation built into GitLab. It's used with custom domains for pages. Uh, we could reuse that and say you can only run DAS tools on external domains if you have verified that you own that domain. Um, and then you can also uh, have an allow list of mm, all local environments, right? Um, yeah, so that was an idea that came to mind while we were talking about that. 
Um, it, it is interesting to me if we do leave it wide open, uh, letting users point tools that simulate attacks at random websites, I can see that causing problems. Yeah, um, and I actually had completely forgotten about the domain validation that we already have. I, I have a issue written up um, for site validation for the active scans where that would be required before running an active scan that actually runs the attacks. Um, this has made me rethink whether we should eventually require it for passive scans as well. I think that the danger is a lot lower because it is just it, whatever you can do as a user and maybe it's worth it just pointing that out to users. But um, I had actually completely forgotten about the domain validation we have. We should look at that, Seth. We should keep that in mind when we get to the site validation uh, point and see if we can reuse any of that. That's it for me. It'll be interesting to see if we could use that, given that like you could do that on the Rails side or the Python side with Dast. Obviously, there's disadvantages to each, but I imagine our solution in GitLab already is only on Rails. Sorry, can you say, say that last part again? I imagine our uh, domain validation that's already built into GitLab is part of the monolith, is it? I think so. Um, yeah, which means it wouldn't be part of the Dast Docker image, which is written in Python. So mm. it would... Let's see. Well, we just have to work out what the limitations are of that if we decided to go with that approach. And, and I, th I think the way we'll probably want to do it is actually on the rail side because we'll want to persist in the database uh, that domain validation. Because um, the issue is if once you do it in Python, then you've got to get it out of the Docker image through an artifact or something to that effect. Uh, whereas if you fire off that request in Rails, you've got access to the database right there. Okay. I think it is currently in the DAST image right now, though, the domain validation that we have. We have CI variables to configure whether it's on or not, yep. and we have some end-to-end -end tests for it in that repo. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and what we don't do today, which is the new version will persist that data. So you'll validate your domain, it'll keep that validated domain for that project. Uh, whereas what we're doing today is we just validate that domain and then run the scan. And then if we want to run that scan again, we have to validate that domain and run the scan. So we'll be changing the uh, infrastructure a little bit so that we're persisting that validation. And also going forward, it will be required for active scans um, uh, just in general. Right now you have a choice of whether you want to require it or not, and which doesn't make uh, a, too much sense to me because it, rather than like you, you're basically only stopping yourself if you want to require it because anybody else could still run a, a scan against your site. Um, but yeah, the main point I think uh, will be to persist it like Seth was saying so that we don't have to redo that validation, especially since we're going to be using these profiles where you could have a different uh, target site target URL with each profile. Anything else? Oh. I think we're pretty much at time here. This looks great. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Really like uh, what it's looking like. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks for all the really helpful questions. There's loads of stuff there that I can get working on soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye.